All right, welcome to the CES meeting. Today is May 25th of 2022, and the topics for today's meeting are um, updates for the Compartment API. We have Jack Works on the call who has questions because uh, uh, their group is implementing the Compartment API as we speak for their purposes. And uh, we have my changes to the Compartment API, which are um, an omnibus of all of the things that we've changed in the last two years since we updated it, <laughs> and uh, um, uh, much of which needs consideration. And uh, if we can manage to get Carity and Matthew here at the same time, by the end of the meeting, we hope to talk about exceptions thrown in shadow realms. Um, and uh, Jack, you had questions. Uh, yeah, I, I, I found the, the module descriptor is um, pretty new uh, because today I implement we are implementing those. I was referring to the endos implementation and uh, the module the module descriptor looks pretty new to me. Uh, I didn't check out the detail yet. Yes, the module descriptors are um, uh, an idea that the the folks at Modable have implemented in XS in order to try to converge on what we have in the CES shim um, and answer some of the longstanding questions that we have um, uh, about making the compartment API suitable for a native implementation. And uh, the, the, motivating, the motivating problem that module descriptors solve is that module map, the values of module maps in CESSHIM and the previous uh, revision of the proposal, the current revision of the proposal, um, module maps, uh, the value of a module map, the value type of the module map option to the compartment constructor is highly overloaded, right? It can be a module namespace object. It can be um, a string. It needed to also be a number of other things. And, um, and the question became, how do we distinguish a module namespace object in a reliable way from all of the other things that we needed to be able to fit into that position, like static module records or static module records with, uh, with metadata? And the metadata for a, a static, so static module records can't capture the per compartment metadata of, a, of, of uh, the static module or of the module, the module source, the static module record um, is an object that captures no information that was not included in the source that it was compiled from, um, which is to say the import meta object is not among the details that are captured by a static module record. Those can vary from compartment to compartment. So the idea is that we solve, uh, that, so that we, well, we, can, we can solve a whole bunch of problems by changing the value type of module map and the return type of module, module map hook and the return value type of the load hook, which we previously called the import hook. Um, if all of those were module descriptors, it increases the uniformity of the uh, of the API. I think makes it clearer. Um, calling in a module descriptor um, harkens to the precedent of a property descriptor, um, and the shape and and the and the nice thing about using a um, a descriptor object is that its shape implies which case it's going to be used for. So. Um, in my proposal, which I'm updating so that XS and Endo can have um, a shared truth to approach now that we're um, getting closer to converging, um, introduces, the no introduces for the first time the notion of, uh, of a module descriptor. And instead of looking at the diff, um, let's look at... Um, no, not the rich diff. That's not what I want. I want to look at the file, the new file. Um, so we're proposing the addition of a module descriptor, which is this uh, tagged union. Um, if it's a string, as before, it's um, uh, 
the name of a static module record in the memo of the incubating compartment, in which case the child compartment inherits that static module record without needing to load it, um, which is very useful uh, embedded system sorry, case. Uh, can you repeat this part again? What does the string represent? The string is the full specifier. In of, which compartment? Of the incubating compartment. So the compartment in which you're calling the compartment constructor. Okay. Um, so this is this is a, 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 a cheap way to say, hey, this the the module loaded in my current compartment is uh, the static module record, which is to say the how to instantiate, not the instance. Um, can pass from the parent to the child, um, as opposed to other cases where the instance is passed, um, uh, which is straw man, I'm proposing that we say namespace and provide the module exports namespace. Um, so that this is the distinction we for um, inheriting a, a namespace versus a record. Um, and then the other uh, the other case is um, passing a descriptor that says here's the static module record or the third party static module record, in which case um, you can optionally say that, uh, uh, and we might not need this, so I'll, I won't cover it right now. The important thing is that this would allow you to carry properties to be assigned to the import meta of the instance before it initializes. Uh why you would need to do that? Isn't it controlled by the compartments? This is how the um, this is how the the uh, how the host defines the behavior of the compartment. Oh, so so in previous version we have the import meta hook. Why not use that? The we can we will have the import meta hook, but its purpose is somewhat more um, more specific. The, the reason for having this is because when implementing um, the Node.js semantics of a compartment in Endo, one of the things that we noticed was that the load hook is in the position. It is inevitable that the load hook will be implemented in such a way that it discovers all of the data necessary to populate import meta and um, putting it in the module descriptor uh, provides a clear way for the load hook to communicate that information back to the compartment, um, as opposed to putting it into a side table and then having the import meta hook share, uh, share that state. And so that when it's uh, called, uh, when the import meta hook gets called later, it can provide um, the information that was discovered during the load hook. This is uh, really just a simpler way um, this is a simpler solution than requiring an import meta hook. Uh, can you give a real world example? What yes. feature Concretely, in Node.js use? Case? Yeah, yeah. Concretely, um, if you look at, uh, well, let me see if I can pull up um, concrete implementation. But the, uh, mm, the concrete implementation might not be illustrative. Uh, but the, the, let, let me talk through it first and see if that's clear enough. Um, a load hook receives a full specifier and is required to return a module record and then potentially additionally also this metadata. I'm, so to make the case for why it needs to return the metadata, the first thing that a load hook needs to do is take the full specifier and then locate the corresponding request URL so supposing that we're using URLs and fetch, right, on the web, um, you take you would first lift the module specifier in its logical namespace into URL namespace, locating it, right, and that gives you a request URL, and then you go off and fetch it, and fetch has the possibility with fetch there is the possibility that you're yes you're going to get the source text, um, provided that it exists. Um, fetch may have to follow a chain of redirects to the actual location of the source, right? Um, so it is actually the response URL 
that Node and the web use as their import meta URL property. So what, what we find is that the load hook in the process of locating the source text before retrieving it, um, or as a, as a side effect of retrieving it, it discovers the import meta URL. So then it has to find a way to communicate that it needs that property to be added to the URL of the meta of the module that's returned. Does that make sense? Uh, sorry, uh, mm, I, I still not get it. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see how many levels of indirection I have to follow to find a concrete example. Import hook is import hook maker. So I have to go over to import hook. Uh, import hook makes for me. Thanks. So I make import hook function returns. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, ultimately, the import hook. Um, uh, nope, this is not going to be illustrative. So I'm going to show you a terminal. Uh, based on what I heard just now, uh, so it's relating to the URL of the imported module. Yeah. Um, so this. So first you, uh, first you have a URL inside the compartment. Then when you load it, you need to convert it to the host understands, so you can retrieve the source text and the retrieve process might have re redirection. Yeah. Uh, this is the only part I understand. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how it's going to relate it to. Yeah, it, it ends up looking like this. Uh, but why it's but why the import meta URL is the real uh, real URL instead of the URL that's meaningful inside that compartment? For example, I have a module called uh, called X, and I do I go over through the load hook. It's become some HTTP URL, uh, but. I uh, but its import meta URL should still be the original surface fire X instead of the real the real URL. Uh, the reason for that, the reason why the web and node both settled on using the response URL is one, they conflate the notion of module specifier and URL. They're one and the same on the web and node. Um, the compartment API allows us. It doesn't require us to, but it allows us to use special uh, separate key spaces for URLs and uh, and module specifiers. Um, but uh, for both, so for your specifier, it's important that uh, the referrer specifier of the module be um, be the to to be after having followed redirects or symbolic links in order for relative module specifiers to find um to find the 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 neighbors to that module in its in its actual location um and a similar there's a similar argument to be used for import meta url in 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 practice import meta url is being used for retrieving adjacent assets in the u uh on the web to, and they are adjacent, not in the logical namespace of the compartment. They're, they are adjacent in the 
physical namespace of the web. So um, if I were to have uh, like one common alias that happens in an, uh, in an endo style compartment that's emulating a node style package is that the name dot refers to dot slash source slash main dot JS, for example, right? And if I were to use dot uh, as the import meta URL, that would be fully qualified to the package location route. But um, if I were to have uh, an, a favicon, a favicon.ico file in source slash favicon.ico, I would use a very different URL um, for the import meta URL, depending on whether um, we're using the request or response URL. I see a hand from Matthew. Uh, okay, I guess I understand the use age, but I think it's it is breaking the visualization. Right. You you give them the real URL instead of the but, visualized URL. Uh, <laughs> if if I, you I need to, I want to understand, Jack. Uh, you don't have to. Like, I think this, from what I understand from Chris, this API gives you an opportunity to give uh, the original URL, but if you want to virtualize it and put whatever else you want in there uh, that would work with your, uh, with that compartment, compartment's virtualization, you still can uh, uh, when the import hook is uh, called, right? Yes, the, the, oh, yeah. the load hook or import hook has the ability to deny, uh, by default, the import hook provides no meta. Um, there's uh, by default, uh, by default, the compartment API does not provide any properties on import meta, then it is it is up to the host to provide or deny. So our position on the compartment API is enabled to that we must enable people to implement the web and node as they are. And provide and also enable access to, to provide um, modules as they've implemented them with a generalization that works for all of those cases. Um, and then okay, more. Okay. I understand this part. It looks okay to me. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, you have another question, I assume. Uh, maybe we can switch back to the, the proposal page and continue. Let me, let me find. <laughs> where I put my window. Uh, yeah, going back to here. Yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, continuing from where I left off, um, there uh, we add that this, this re revision of the proposal adds the notion of a third-party static module record as well. That wasn't there before. Um, and third-party static module records allow us to link JSON, WASM, Etc. cetera, um, with the caveat that the third-party static module record doesn't support dynamic, well, doesn't support live binding. With Modable's modifications to this, there is a possibility that it does support live binding, which I need to investigate. Um, the third-party static module record that XS has implemented, uh, which differs from the one that we implemented in the shim, provides a static bindings array, which is essentially equivalent to the result of a static analysis of an ESM and an initialized function, which receives the module environment record. And I have a feeling that modable. Um, what is this module environments record? Yeah, the module environment record is the internal representation of the namespace of the module that only the module has access to. Um, it is a thing that exists in implementations. It's just not uh, reified as a, as a JavaScript object. This is an object that has the, the namespace corresponds to the properties that are imported or exported in the namespace of the module. That is to say that if something is, if uh, imports X as Y, the property Y Will will be the be on the module environment record, whereas the property X will exist on the module namespace object of the thing that was imported. Um, uh, likewise, you? if you export X as Y, X will be a property of the module environment record, 
whereas y will be a property of the module namespace. Uh, can you write a third party static module code in JavaScript? Can you define it in JavaScript? If that's yes, well that, that is the intention. That is what this is for. Yeah. Uh, mm, yes. can, you, can, you, can you write a, a demo one now? Uh, yeah. I think it will be better to understand. Please, in the meantime, can you paste the, 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 this, this, uh, this link into the chat? Yeah. Are you having the screen right now? For sure. All right. Um, yeah, you want to see an example of a third party module record. Um, uh, again, I think I will resort to a terminal window in order to provide a minimum educational and uh, <laughs> Uh, example instead of uh, a, a practical working example that has a lot more details. Um, so if I were to, um, oh, you know what? Actually, I do have an educational example laying around because the CES tests provide this. Endo packages, CES, uh, test, CJS, test import CJS, heuristic. Okay, so suppose that you are implementing common JS. One of the things that you would need to do is heuristic module and uh, uh, module import and export analysis, and this is a really dumb version of that. <laughs> like that this is just using a regular expression to look for exports dot name and require calls, um, and is sufficient for tests. <laughs> Anything that we would use in production is using an actual parser. Uh, actually, we're using a lexer, uh, the same lexer that Node uses for this purpose. Um, but so a CGS static module record Im implements a um, implements a third party static module record. And the one of the caveats of this is that this is using the API that we implemented in. Um, this is the API that we implemented in the shim um, and doesn't reflect what I'm proposing for the, the standard, but it should give you the right idea. The idea is that module exports corresponds loosely to an, a module environment record. And we do some common JSC things and create a require call that uses import now behind the scenes in this case uh, in order to return the namespaces of things that are imported. And then we create a functor. This is a common JS functor that just wraps the source of the common JS module in a, fun and, uh, a function that it receives require exports module file name, dir name. Um, and then uh, we return uh, the old idea of a static module record, which was just the declarations of imports, exports, and an execute. This has changed into bindings and initialize. Um, let me go back to the the text. Um, the difference is that uh, the bindings array uh, consists of all of these import star as, uh, in, import export star, uh, import export as and from. And the, uh, um, the effect is the same, except that the bindings array um, preserves the order in a way that the old form did not. And the initialize no longer requires us to pass a compartment and an import now in because the module environment record has all of the proper names already bound um, to the module environment record. So all of the, all of the names from foreign, foreign, uh, foreign modules are already realized as names on the module environment record. So the common JS thing just needs to keep track of where things were and, and just do uh, 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 assignment to properties of this object, which we uh, have not yet um, attempted. Uh, in, in, the, in the previous uh, code you showed, uh, the, the, uh, the common JS module record can, have, uh, can get the compartment instance but in the proposals API, there is no compartment show up. That's right. Uh, then I how are you going to evaluate in that compartment? Yeah. 
<laughs> Matthew's question. That that is uh, my question. Like, how are you going to evaluate your source? Yeah, uh, we provide a. Um, we have not done this yet. I am confident that it can be done. It's a matter of um, providing uh, that the stat the, the the initialize function would be uh, would need to provide. Uh, it, it needs to, regardless, you need to be able to pass require and uh, require and exports and module into the underlying source. That So the source is just evaled and we're injecting those things. The require function will need to be more elaborate. The require function needs to be able to, uh, from the analysis phase, we will have to keep track of um, what the name is for every namespace object of something that uh, every namespace object that was imported from another module in the bindings array. It's, it's just a matter of tracking that map and providing a more rich require and exports object. Um, and I, I realize I, that I'm waving my hands. I have literally never written the code that does this. Um, I guess I'm still confused because for CommonJS, the source code is actually wrapped so mm -hmm. the transform to the to the source code, and I, I just don't see how, um, so, how that, yeah, that's going to work. Yeah, the require function that's passed into the source is going to close over that module environment record, and have to track. And we and in the analysis phase, we'll need to produce a map that says this specifier, this import specifier from the require call corresponds to this property of the environment rec module record. Um, does that make sense? Not entirely, but um... it's, it's basically for common JS, anything that is required is going to have to have a binding constructed for it of the form um, uh, uh, that I need to get the namespace object of this other module and then give it a provisional name on the environment record. And then we just keep track of what we set what we what we set in our bindings and what we want our require calls to return. So like every require call corresponds to a binding of import star as name from uh, yeah and and so all the um, exports uh, even assignment and stuff like that you're assuming the source is already pre-processed to have removed all of those things no, no no we're we're passing in a fake require and exports object that performs the mutation i the, I, I understand that you can also assign export subject for example uh assigning to the the module exports property just as a matter of no, yeah but assigning to the module exports and then it would automatically be uh actually it won't yeah you're right uh, but yeah, assign, so, oh yeah, you're right. So you don't assign, they're not live bindings, obviously. Uh, yeah, okay. But assigning to uh, module.exports. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, we have to have special logic for that as we already do in the previous implementation, module exports assignment is, is captured. Um, I do not feel like we've gotten to the bottom of this topic, but I do want to make some space for Matthew and Kariti to catch up. Is this a good time to segue? I have one quick uh, observation on the module descriptor. Um, yeah. I'm, in general, I'm not a fan of doing a variation between a string and, uh, and an object, uh, but it, yeah, I'm wondering if, if it's a string, it, can it should it be just model as another uh, object in that union? I think so. Yeah, I agree. Uh, have to, or at least have have an equivalent one that exists and still allow the string as a as a shorthand. But uh, I, I very that it doesn't very much in favor of having only one or the other. And I agree that it makes the most sense to have another form of descriptor rather than having a string versus object uh, union. Um, and it's just a matter of getting consensus with Modable. Um, I, I can I can propose that in this change. Let's uh, let's capture that in the diff um, 
as a comment. Um, and I can do that while you go on to the next topic, Matthew, if that's all right. Um, I guess I can share my own screen now for um, if I can track back where. Um, Lost it. On the compressor, I was on the phone. Uh, could not really put me on, uh, on the queue for question, but on the compartments, I, I feel like I, I, I need to put some time on understanding all these better. Um, but it feels to me that we're still very complicated, still covering a lot of ground. It, it feels to me very similar to what happened with the loader API, where we spend years trying to go for a very compelling solution that can do a lot of things and then we fail to deliver that so we need to be conscious about it and hopefully trying to simplify it as much as possible because uh it seems like a massive massive uh, uh feature and we don't have a very good track record for big big features yeah yeah i'm aware um yeah, yeah, especially aware since, uh, yeah, uh, excluding a module loader API from ESM was the simplification that made it possible to reach consensus. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, I'm, I'm fine with having like a, a few offline sync up with you or some, some other people trying to see that can help a little bit there, but. Yeah, was... the, the problem, the, the trouble for the module loader API is that um, there is inherent complexity that we can't paper over, and there isn't actually all that much incidental complexity. Um, yeah, no, I, I feel that that's true, but I, I, I feel that when you look at the different use cases, some of them you might be able to solve it with um, solutions that you have for other use cases. So moving more things to the user line might be a good strategy. Um, and it, it might not give you the full advantage that you have with this API, but it, it will give us uh, a path forward with the committees uh, to try to get something in and then we can move from there. But My intuition on that actually is the same. Um, but I think that I've, uh, but from working on this, I think that I've walked past my intuition to a new, uh, to this state, the, uh, I, the original proposal that I had made for, um, like before ESM, <laughs> my, my proposal was, uh, that all we needed for a module loader API for whatever module system we adopt into the language would be to introduce a module constructor function that's analogous to a function constructor that would be analogous to the static module record, um, but be directly executable by user code without an associated compartment. Um, that's the key though, the without the associated compartment, we do need to model the compartment in order to be able to have separate globals um, and separate evaluators and isolation. All, all of that is necessary and uh, in order for us to get this, to make this useful for purposes of CES. Um, I, I agree that there is a simpler module loader API that just gives us something like the static module record and it directly implements hooks. Um, but uh, yeah. It, it's worth considering, and I'd love to have more conversations with you about it, Kariti. Um, it's just a, uh, but I think that in that process, we will walk ourselves back to basically this API. All right. Um, and uh, so we are we are removing um, time zone and the locales visualization rights. Um, as a matter of uh, streamlining and simplifying, as Garrity points, in order to 
pr present the narrowest profile of a compartment to TC39 in order to make progress. That is not to say that it, our ambitions um, are limited. Uh, so if we are not going to do it in the compartments, um, do, do you have any plan in the future? The idea is that if we needed that, we would solve it either in, at the realm or compartment boundary. Yeah. Uh, okay, that sounds okay. Yeah, the uh, having a compartment in the language will make follow up. It will make compart having realms and compartments in the language will make those obvious point points to hook on other host virtualization hooks as they as they come up and are needed. Um, for the moment, for the purpose of creating a hardened JavaScript environment, we don't need host virtualization hooks for time zone, etc., because we simply omit. Uh, we omit anything that closes over that state from the shared intrinsics. That is to say that by default, the hardened JavaScript compartment does not receive temporal or intel um, because we can't harden those without host virtualization hooks for time zone, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah. Look like the the module specifier part is not very stable yet mm, module specifiers are very stable but also very host defined i mean those a uh, lot of lot of new hooks i see just now which ones uh Um, the one that you just explained to me. Uh, the import is, meta is hook. The, the load hook. There, the, there are only, the hooks are uh, module map hook, which receives a full specifier. Uh, the load hook, which receives a full specifier. Uh, the resolve hook, which returns a full specifier. Um, and import meta hook does not uh, well it reserves a it receives a meta object uh, it might receive it anyhow those are all of the hooks or is there is there another one that i'm not aware of um no oh okay I, I i will check out the proposal to see if i can implement it um, because my current implementation is based on system js and uh, its format does not obeys the, the proposals one. Mm -hmm. mm, I have another question. Uh, does the SES current implementation requires eval? Yeah, uh, yes. Well, okay. so it, it so uses to... eval if you if you use import, yes. Okay, so yeah, I'm do I'm, I'm working on a no eval version of compartments. That's yeah. only accepts pre-compiled module records. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's consistent. Um, the SES shim isn't in a position where it can do that yet, but when we implement module descriptors, we will be, I think. Uh, uh, but the form of there, there would have to we'd have to have something different for. Um, injecting pre-compiled that have been pre-evaluated, I should say, or pre pre uh, pre-evaluated, not just pre-compiled um, static module records, so that they can be embedded in um, an asset as opposed to embedded as strings. That seems possible, actually. That's interesting. Um, yeah, uh, for real now, handing over to Matthew. All right, let me share my screen. Uh, I'll try to do a condensed uh, version here. Um, so the Shadow Realm uh, API as proposed uh, basically prevents anything thrown from one side of the callable binary um, to or actually, I don't know what we, we talked about this a couple of months ago. And I think what we ended up at was 
it is fine for uh, primitives thrown ac across a callable binary to uh, be to end up as an exception thrown on the other side with that primitive value, or maybe a wrapped function. Uh, but for objects uh, to keep uh, a, a, an object thrown, including a real error thrown across uh, the callable binary, uh, would just end up as a generic type error because uh, it cannot go across the binary. Um, there then uh, questions came up about um, well, how what is the about the developer experience for uh, for those things. Um, so now if you have a generic type error that's created there, you lose the stack information that you potentially had, uh, or even the error name that you had uh, of the original error. And then, um, so the developer is not able to understand automatically what happened. Um, and this is Shadow Realm being a low level API, um, it is conceivable that we put the burden on the user code using the Shadow Realm API to catch uh, exceptions before the callable boundary and pass them over through a membrane line system or a reporting system uh, to, to, to report exceptions uh, thrown uh, during the execution. So use the callable boundary, the user code should be aware of the callable boundary and, uh, and and the same way it can't let object go through, uh, it would have to catch exceptions and uh, have a reporting uh, system for those. Uh, um, however, uh, the feedback that we subs subsequently got is uh, errors thrown by user code are not all errors that might end up um, uh, there. So if you have, a wrapped functions that will be the case. However, there are the there is the case of uh, import value. So shadow uh, instance dot import value or dot evaluate uh, for script code. Um, the process of resolving a module, the host might end up um, throwing an error, especially with node and uh, import um, and module loader hooks, or I don't remember exactly how that works in, uh, in Node, which actually may be JavaScript implemented. Uh, and those errors, the way it's currently uh, working is that they would actually originate from inside the Shadow Realm already. Um, so the question is, if you made a mistake, for example, in uh, or there's a problem with your, um, with your module graph, and now you're doing import value, um, the host should be able to provide information to the developers that something went haywire with their imports. Uh, and at that point, no code, user code from inside the Shadow Realm would have executed. Uh, so there is no way for uh, the Shadow Realm user to actually um, uh, do its own reporting of that. So, I think the core question is how to improve the developer experience for in conceptually for anything where the user code is not able um, to uh, to handle errors. And um, yeah, so so my it, 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 what my my suggestion was like, let's try to find a way so that host errors or anything basic, any errors thrown before um, user code has, uh, has started execution. So if it's an evaluation before we actually uh, evaluate the source code or uh, before we start evaluating uh, the uh, source of, um, of a, an imported module, uh, any errors thrown before that somehow to be able to throw them with full information uh, in the uh, incubator realm, in the incubator realm. Well, I'm a little confused. Um, so for me, the different, uh, there, there is a fine line between evaluate and import value. Uh, the fact that evaluate is synchronous. Um, there are two types of errors that only can happen there, uh, as far as I know. 
one is a syntax error, um, the other one is a, a initialization error when when, when uh, executing that, that program. And one of them can be reported from the outside, one of them must be reported from the inside because we don't know what the nature of that error is. And, and I hope that everyone is on the same page on that. Like, yeah, I, I think evaluate, there is, I, I don't see how, I think evaluate is less of a concern. Uh, I, I think we should be able to say like syntax errors uh, are just thrown with full information because- Which is the case today, which is the case yeah. today. I think the big sticking point uh, is import value. So in the import value, um, I, I believe we might, we might be able to pull this off, but it will be tricky because the moment you start doing the, the, the process to load the module and yada yada or load the module graph, if there is any problem there, um, you're already multiple layers down into these abstract operations that has no knowledge about who was the initiator of the, of the loading mechanism. Um, so by the time you get an error, an exception might be too late for us to unwind all, all that complexity, but we might, we might be able to pull this off by making some, or adding some, um, doing some gymnastics on the spec to be able to carry on some of the context of where the initialization is, is happening right now. I'm not sure, but it, it might be might be possible. Um, so I, I I think I agree in, in principle that we we could get this done for the purpose of um, reporting those errors from the incubator realm on the assumption that it is a problem in the in the operation that the incubator realm is trying to carry on, which is importing a value but it's importing a, a value that cannot be resolved by, um, by the, the ROM. So the error that you get is on the incubator ROM saying you're not, you, you cannot do that. Um, so I, I feel that that's possible, but it will be tricky. Yeah, I, um, so I think Shu uh, put something on the agenda for the next plenary. Uh, which is basically trying to answer from some questions in general, um, like whether uh, in general stacks, they're not specs currently, uh, but if it's something uh, that should be available uh, through the callable battery, some information that should be available, whether the message is information that should be available through the callable battery. Um, I, I think in, in, in general, my opinion is still, Shadow Realm is a low-level API, um, and the callable binary itself, in, in as in the wrapper, uh, the wrapped functions, should keep denying uh, thrown objects, whatever they are, even if they are error objects. Uh, and uh, and um, so, and, and that would result in an opaque type error. You would lose that information. Um, and I, I, I agree, it's not great for the developer experience, but um, that is something still under the Shadow Realms uh, users control. They, they could catch and log or report however, uh, however they want. Um, and, and I think everybody on this call, at least last time, was uh, okay with that approach, but um, it's very likely that the rest of the committee might not see it that way. Um, I surely don't know enough about the spec plumbing and the implementations currently to know how we would be able to make import value behave in a developer friendly way for errors. Um, I, I really hope we can find a solution there.
who would I'm not sure what, what is the best way to solve this problem. <laughs> I sure I, I just can only think of like what I'd like it, how I would like it to behave. I just don't know how to make that happen. I'm not entirely sure that we still have Caridi. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> okay, we do have Caridi. Caridi does not have an answer. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, all right. Well, I guess hopefully uh, something will come up. Uh, hopefully we'll come up with an answer or a direction uh, at, uh, at plenary next month. I like I like uh, Shu's um, way of thinking about this. Well, yeah, I, it it gets. I mean, obviously, direct object reference shouldn't cross the callable boundary. But um, the thing is that you can throw anything. Like, why? Why are we starting to pierce uh, special case some things in uh, through the callable boundary? Uh, errors are just a special case value. It would be a special case value in that case. It yeah. just it does not feel right. Uh, so, have we tried any of these in Safari? I believe Safari implemented um, the completely opaque typer uh, and. Uh, that is why this came up is they were trying to debug uh, some of their uh, tests for uh, Shadow Realm and they were like, we have no information. How do we debug this? I mean, Matthew, having special cases is interesting because I mean, it would be wrong on principle, but in practice, it's attackable. We could use this. I mean, if an error can be anything, we can just throw anything we want. <laughs> but you can already throw uh, primitives. Exactly. <laughs> it's fine to throw a primitive. Oh, um, I still think there it might be interesting to throw a callable and uh, and wrap it uh, on the, on the way, uh, but that's more arguable. <laughs> um, All right. Yeah. Uh, well, we discussed this on the. Uh, we have a meeting before this meeting uh, with the Shadow Realm uh, implementers and a bunch of other people. The part of the tools uh, uh, meeting, and this was one of the ask where we are on this. Uh, so it's this is one of the pressing issues. Oh, I I didn't realize that was discussed uh, in another meeting recently. No, I, they were asking as they we're going to discuss it in an hour. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> so um, we're at time. Uh, let's, um, yeah, if we need to talk about this again next week, please put it on the agenda. It'd be, it'd be welcome. I am um, very hopeful to talk about return override uh, sometime uh, soon. Oh, that was, that's a fun one as well. Yeah, um, likewise. Okay, um, I'm gonna call the meeting. Thank you again, everybody for coming. <laughs>